David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went down to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to, to David to Keilah, he, came, he, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to, go, uh, to, to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the, two, and the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horish on the hill of Hakalah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure, know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arabah, to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went, uh, went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his, and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore the place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of Engedi. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be here together tonight. We're grateful for your word, for the truth that we find in it. God, may we be strengthened by the preaching of your word. Would you strengthen me as I attempt to preach? God, encourage us with the gospel tonight as we look at the scriptures. Give us clear heads and clear minds as we go forth and help us, God, 
to be obedient servants of the King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look into the text, the driving focus that we're going to see is that God is preserving the coming king. See, what we know is that David is the rightful heir to the king, right? He's going to be king. Uh, king Saul knows this. Uh, he knows this because he broke God's law. Uh, so God's punishment for Saul is that he was going to lose his kingdom. He's no longer going to be king. Samuel uh, prophesied it, and God is bringing it to pass. It's known that David is the coming king. So we're going to see this theme, God preserving the coming king. And Saul, being a man not after God's own heart, uh, is searching. He's hunting for David so that he can kill him. Saul is seeking to somehow thwart God's divine decree. If, if only he can kill David, he will remain king over Israel. And so in this passage, uh, that's the very thing that's taking place. For a little context, in 1 Samuel 22, you should all know this, but we've just seen all these, all these priests slain by the sword of Doeg, by the decree of King Saul. But one escaped. <laughs> We're going to see him in our passage. His name is Abiathar. He's the son of Ahimelech. Not only did he escape, but he did so with an ephod, which is like this specific robe-like piece of clothing that's worn by priests. Except this ephod is a little different. It's not their typical linen ephod that they wore, but it's the ephod that was used for inquiring of the Lord. And so David has this priest and this ephod with him. So we can say that David has the ear of the Lord with him. I'll just kind of jump right in. Immediately we're going to see like this stark contrast between David and King Saul. See, the passage starts with, with David being told, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and robbing the threshing floors. In fact, this should have been told to King Saul, right? Because he's the king. He's supposed to protect the people. But it wasn't, told to, it wasn't told to Saul because Saul was so obsessed with finding and killing David. Now, that, that's where his thoughts are. That's the only thing that's concerning King Saul. So instead, they told the rightful king. Uh, the one who would be on the throne. They came and they told David. They told him for a few reasons. <laughs> uh, they know that David is going to protect them, right? And they know that because David is God's man, uh, he's capable of protecting them. And they know that David is willing to put his fears to the side, this uh, coming King Saul to the side, put that out of his mind, and protect his people. And so what does David do when he hears of this need? He inquires of the Lord. That's the first thing David does. The passage says, uh, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. David is ready to protect his people, but he also knows to ask for the Lord's guidance. He doesn't want to go against God's decrees or God's instruction. David is a man who trusts in the Lord. And you'll recall uh, the time he went up against another Philistine, uh, the giant Goliath, right? Uh, he reminds the people that the armor and the sword that's offered to him, those aren't the things that's going to protect him. No, it's the God uh, who, who saved him from the lion and the bear. That's the God who's going to deliver him. And so this time's the same. David remembers God's faithfulness. And so David goes before the Lord, seeking God's providence and protection for himself, for his men, and for the people. He's not worried about King Saul because he knows that God has decreed he's going to be the king. And so while he may be afraid in this situation, he knows that God is his refuge. God is his protection. And he knows that God has provided him with an army capable of protecting, uh, providing deliverance for his people. David's men, on the other hand, they're afraid to go. They say to, they say to David, David, we're afraid here in Judah. Like, how much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Like, they, they don't want to die, right? And so David criticizes them for their lack of faith, right? Oh, you of little faith. No, he doesn't do that. The passage tells us that David goes again 
to the Lord. And he feels the concern, the weightiness, uh, the, the thoughts of his men, and he reconfirms with God. And the Lord answered, Arise and go to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. We read earlier the, that, that the Lord tells David to go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But here he gets a little more specific as he answers the second question from David, right? He says, if you will go attack these Philistines, if you will go down to Keilah and fight against the Philistines, I'll give them into your hand. It's at this moment, with this answer, that David has this promise from God. Remember, David knows he can trust in the promises of God. In fact, he's been doing that this whole time. And so when God promises deliverance in this passage, David knows he can trust the Lord. He, he remembers what God has already done. So with this promise in mind, David wastes no time. He takes his men with him. They go down to Keilah and they attack the Philistines. And guess what? God fulfills his promise. He hands over the Philistines. And they brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And look at verse 6. It tells, us, uh, it tells us that the priest Abiathar went to Keilah with David and his men. And not only did Abiathar go, but he brought this ephod. And remember, that's for inquiring of the Lord, for going to God. And so David has this, this priest of God with him. So I think it's safe to say that this is a picture of David having God's favor. Right? He's, got the, he's got the priest and the ephod. He's got God's ear. He's got God's favor. David, his men... And the priest of Abiathar are all down in Keilah going against the Philistines in the name of the Lord. But David's traveling doesn't escape Saul's knowledge. Now, he has spies in the land, and it comes to Saul's attention that David is in Keilah. And here's the difference that we see between David and Saul. You see, David knows the promises of God. He knows that God has established him as the coming king. He knows that God is preserving the coming king. And Saul knows the same thing. As we're going to learn later, Jonathan tells us Saul knows this. We know Saul knows it. But when he learns that David is in Keilah, listen to what he says in verse 7. Look at verse 7. God has given him, he's given David into my hand. For he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bar. This fortified city, Saul thinks, is somehow going to stop God's decrees, God's plan. And Saul says, David is trapped. He can't escape me any longer. It comes across as if Saul is saying, God has put David in gates and bars for me, for me, for King Saul. Saul thinks that God is somehow trapped, that God's decrees are somehow trapped in this fortified city, but that's not the case. God is working out his purposes. He is establishing his faithfulness to his people, and specifically here in our passage to David. He didn't give David over to the Philistines. Instead, he gave the Philistines into David's hand. And David is, he's not even the king yet. But God is working out his, his purpose of making David into the king. And we, and we know that so far, all these attempts on David's life by, by Saul have been stopped. Saul can't touch David. David is God's chosen king. And church, I don't, I don't want you to miss this. God is working his decrees. He's proving his faithfulness, his trustworthiness. And more than that, he's proving that he's a promise keeper. Saul has closed his mind to that. His eyes are shut to the fact that God is this honorable, truth-telling, all-powerful God. His will cannot be trapped in gates and bars. His decrees are not stopped by fortified cities. And Saul doesn't realize that. Or he, he's, he's just throwing it out of his mind. He's attempting to honor God here with his lips, uh, but his, his heart is far from God. Right? He said, God has given him into my hands. And because of that, verse 8 tells us, Saul summoned all the people to go to war, to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And then listen to this. It goes on to say, David knew that Saul was plotting to harm him. So what does David do? 
Uh, just like we saw earlier, he goes before the Lord. So David calls Abiathar. He says, bring the ephod to me. Then David, though he knows Saul is coming against him, he doesn't raise up his army and say, we're going to stop this now. We're going, to, we're going to handle this our way. No, see, David says, bring the ephod so that I may inquire of the Lord. And he cries out to God, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. And then what he does is he asks God a few questions. He says, will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will, God, will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And God's honest with him. He just tells him, he says, he will come down. And then David asks again, will, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yeah, they're going to surrender you. So these people who, who David has just saved from the Philistines are going to be willing to, to hand David and his men right over to Saul. It's obviously because uh, they know that when, when Saul comes, he's going to stop at nothing to get his hands on David. Saul's, he, he's so obsessed with being king over Israel that, that he began to look at his own strength instead of looking to God for strength, but David isn't like that. There's another... This, this is the other big difference between Saul and David, between the current king and the coming king. The difference between these men is that David looks to the Lord for his protection and guidance, and Saul is a pull-himself-up-by-his-bootstraps kind of guy. And Saul is led by his heart, by his ungodly desires, by the, by the lust of his flesh. He doesn't want to give up his kingship. Though God has decreed it, Saul is fighting tooth and nail against it, against God, against his decrees. And as David looks... To the Lord for guidance and protection, the Lord tells him that the peop people of Keilah will surrender. him. And so we pick up in verse 13. It says, Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. And listen to this. But God did not give him into his hand. See, God is faithful. His promises are true. His promises are yes and amen. They're going to take place. They're going to happen. And we know this. In fact, we can search the scriptures for a time that, that, that God was a liar, and we're not going to find it. Uh, so you and I, just as, just as David is trusting in the Lord in this passage that we see, uh, we, can, we can trust in the Lord for his promises and his protection. Uh, we, can, we can look to the Lord just as David is. So we can read this, this book that, that God has gifted to us where he reveals uh, his character to us, and we can say that God is a faithful God. His faithfulness rings true throughout all generations. The same God who clothed Adam and Eve after they sinned is the same God who's clothing us in the righteousness of Christ. The same God who drew Abraham away from worshiping false gods is the same God who took us from worshiping false gods. The faithfulness of God is the reason Jesus came. That same faithfulness is the reason that Jesus lived a perfect life, obedience to God's law perfectly. It's God's faithfulness that led Jesus to the cross, that put him in the grave, and it's God's faithfulness that raised him from the dead. We can trust God. And as we read stories like 1 Samuel 23, we can be reminded of God's faithfulness. When Saul thinks he has David cornered and trapped, God did not give David into Saul's hand. Saul pursued him daily, but he couldn't get him. He couldn't find David. He couldn't lay a hand on God's man, on the coming king. And it's because God's covenant promises will be kept. So y'all, church, you can rely on that. Knowing that you're secure in the arms of the Lord. You can read this story and know that. Uh, not only will God keep his promises, but he won't forsake his children and that's good news tonight if you're God's children. You can rely on God 
for being and doing what he said he will be and do. Commentators say that, that David likely wrote Psalm 63 while here in the wilderness. From 1 Samuel 23 comes Psalm chapter 63. And, and Psalm 63 is this psalm where David is praising God for satisfying him. He writes, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. David is, is praising God in, in this psalm that he writes in the wilderness while he's being pursued by his enemy. He, he, he's praising God for his provision, his protection, and his promises. And church, I'm telling you that we can praise God for the same things. Because he's delivered us. If we're in Christ, if by faith we've received Christ, you've been delivered. We can, we can rely on God in the same way that David is. He's kept his promises and satisfied us through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' perfect life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead, God has secured for us an eternal home. We can trust him. And so while we're being pursued by our own flesh at times, or while we're being pursued by the enemy who is accusing us, Night and day, we can, re we can rest on the promises of the Almighty. We can know that it's God who is our joy, who is our comfort, who is our protection, and who is our deliverer. And that's not the only thing we can learn from this passage, though. See, another lesson we can learn comes from, from Jonathan in verses 15 through 18. I also want to make a quick note of how quickly Jonathan finds David, Right? Why is that? Saul can't find him. Saul's got an army. But Jonathan knows right where to go. <laughs> Let's start in verse 15 here. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, Saul's own son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And here's how he did that. Here's how he strengthened David. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. I, I, I think that, that Jonathan is this clear picture of what Paul writes about in Galatians 6, verse 2. He writes, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Of course, we know the law of Christ is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think this is what uh, Jonathan is doing here for David. He's loving his neighbor. He's loving his brother. He comes to strengthen David's hand in God. You see, in the, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hard times, church, it's our job to strengthen one another in God. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're in a local church. That's one of the reasons for uh, meaningful church membership. So we can love one another, we can build one another up, and we can strengthen each other's hand in God. Now, how can we do that? What's that look like? I think we can take a note from, from Jonathan here. How did he do it? He reminded David uh, of God's faithfulness and, and the promises of God. He says, Do not fear. I don't know about y'all, but I can really relate to David here. Like, I'm a guy who needs some encouragement, knowing that God will not abandon me and, and that he will keep his promises. And so maybe you're like me. Maybe you also need to be strengthened in the Lord. As pain and suffering may come your way. And so when times are tough, when, there are, when, when you're facing hardships, I think I can stay confident, confidently with with Jonathan here, do not fear. Do not fear. For the Lord is your salvation and your strength. More than that, we can remind one another of the promises of God. Look at what Jonathan says to David in verse 17. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. We can remind one another of the promises of God. When we're going through trials, right, we can remind one another that these trials are really the means by which God is refining you, by which God is sanctifying you. So persevere knowing that it's, it's God who keeps you and God who sanctifies you. We can encourage one another in the Lord. 
when sin and temptation are ever present in our, in our minds and our hearts and our desires are flaring up against us, when we're fighting the flesh, this battle that Paul details in Romans chapter 7, we can remind one another of Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Jesus is the one who conquered sin for us, for those who trust in him. He's conquered it. The battle that you're facing, the sin that you're facing, the temptation that's overcoming you, know that it's finished in Christ. We should remind one another of God's faithfulness, of, of his deliverance, of his promises. That's what Jonathan does for David here. It's a joyful responsibility that we have to strengthen one another, to remind one another of, of the goodness of God. That's one of the purposes of the regular Sunday gathering, right? Like, don't forsake that. <laughs> it's not some arbitrary law that the writer of Hebrews put together, right? No, it's, it's one, of the purposes, uh, uh, one of the purposes of the regular Sunday gathering is to be strengthened in your faith so that you may persevere to the end. So be like Jonathan here. <laughs> Love one another. Encourage one another. Let's continue. As David and his men are in the wilderness, and David's faith is strengthened by Jonathan, it's evident that God is keeping his hand over this coming king. When it seems like it may come to an end, uh, because the Ziphites are, are willing to give David up, they know, they know where he is, like they know this dude's precise location. Like, and, and they're willing just to hand him over. So they, the Ziphites, they go to Saul and they begin to make a deal with him. And if I'm being honest, this deal kind of reminds me of the deal that Judas made, Ju Judas made to, to give Jesus over. And the Ziphites go and they make a deal with Saul. They say in verse 20, Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desires to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. Isn't that oddly similar to what Judas did? And maybe, maybe there's some stuff missing here, but it, it seems like they're willing to do it for free. And so remember Saul, he's, he's worshiping God with his lips, though his heart is far from God. He, he says, may you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Though he's grateful for what the Ziphites know, Saul doesn't want to just know the general area where David is. He wants to know where he's standing. He wants to know those exact coordinates, like, where is this dude sleeping? He wants to know this because Saul knows that David is, is evasive. He's cunning. He's slippery. So Saul responds to them saying, Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there. Know the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. So they went. David and his men are still in the wilderness. They're, they're deeper in the wilderness, and, and Saul goes to seek him. But David was told, like, he, he has this information. Saul always thinks he has the upper hand, but David always seems to be aware of what Saul's doing, of what Saul is plotting. Why? Uh, it's because God is faithful to his servant. Look at verse 25. So David went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain, and David was hurrying to get away from Saul. The picture that I have in my mind is that David is always evading capture. He's This capture that always seems inevitable, David is somehow evading it. He's, he's always quicker than Saul. He's always more cunning than Saul. He's always more slippery than Saul. He's in Saul's grasp, but David somehow gets out of it. Uh, the Lord continues to keep Saul from getting his hands on David. I'm, I, I'm reminded a lot of Jesus uh, here, because in the Gospels, if I remember correctly, Jesus seemed to be pretty slippery. Like, think back to when the Pharisees are trying to seize him and kill him. Like, he would be in the middle of a crowd, they, would, they, they, know, they know where he is, right? 
and then he would just disappear. He's, he's just gone. They couldn't get him. And the reason we're told that this continues to happen is because it was not yet Jesus' time to be handed over. It was not yet his time to die. God's purpose for Jesus' life was not yet complete. Nothing that God set his, sets his hand to will ever come up short. It never finishes early, and it never finishes late. It always finishes just as he planned it. It always finishes on time. So David, uh, so many times, he's, he's in Saul's grasp. He's trapped in a fortified city with gates and bars, but Saul can't get him. He's in the wilderness. Saul knows his exact location, but Saul can't get him. And it's because God has decreed that David will be the king. God is preserving the coming king, King David. And here we see Saul's plans stopped again. Look at verse 27. A messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. It's actually kind of funny to me, right? Like, this is like ironic, full circle kind of moment, right? Because uh, remember at the beginning of the passage, uh, David goes down to save Keilah, and, he, and he's saving them from the Philistines. <laughs> and now David is trapped. Saul's closing in. And who stops Saul's plans? Who saves the day for David? It's the Philistines. Like every time we turn around in the scriptures, David's, he's killing Philistines. He's I can always killing him. And unbeknownst to them, to the Philistines, they saved David's life here. Saul can't get him. Again, Saul's out of luck. We've already seen that Saul doesn't have a lot of regard for, for the people that he's entrusted to, so why does this attack from the Philistines draw him away? Like, what makes him turn around this time? Uh, it's, it's likely here that, that the very place he's being attacked is Saul's like, house where he lives. His stuff's being seized. So he turns around. And so in verse 28, we read that Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. So we have God preserving the coming king. Here it is. God preserved David's life so that he'd be king just as God promised. But I wonder if there's more to the story. Like, can we, can we draw a little bit more out of the passage? Can we, can we just squeeze it for all that it's got? Because we all know that, that David will eventually become king, but his kingship will come to an end. Like, he wasn't the king forever, but there was a promise that his throne would be established forever, right? So I wonder if I can show you that, that God is preserving not only the immediate king, the coming king and David, but in providing protection for David, God is preserving the coming king, Jesus. Now, Jesus is the eternal king who will sit on the throne forever. And he's out of the line of David. But God has secured Jesus as this eternal king. In fact, right now, he's at the right hand of the Father and the whole world is his footstool. And so while we can see that God is surely preserving David, King David in this passage, more importantly, he's preserving the coming king, King Jesus, who would be born centuries later, who would come into the world to save sinners. The king who himself would be pursued by his enemies, by the people who were supposed to be worshipers and, and followers of God, these supposed God-fearing men of God are the ones who pursue Jesus. And king Jesus never sinned. He never broke God's law. And like David, he sought God's will, right? Not my will, but yours be done. This same Jesus who lived a life without sin, the same King Jesus who was sold by his friend for 30 pieces of silver, who knew the exact location of Jesus and was able to deliver him over. And though Jesus had never sinned, he's, he's taken and he's beaten beyond recognition. He's hung on a tree and they put a sign over his head. What's it say? This is the king of the Jews. And they didn't know what they were writing when they put that over, over his head. They, they, they wrote it with mockery, but what they wrote was true. Jesus is the rightful king. King over all things, not just the Jews. And, and he died on that cross, and he was put in a grave. And, and praise be to the king, to King Jesus. After three days, he was raised from the dead. 
So we can look here. 1 Samuel 23. We can see how God is, is not just preserving David for David's sake, right? Now God is preserving the line of David so that through the line of David, God's Christ, King Jesus, would come and bring reconciliation to God's people. God preserved David so that he could bring the true and better king, King Jesus, into the world to reconcile those who are far from God. As we wrap up here, I, I want to leave you with a few things, uh, a few things to do, a few things to recall. Just I want you to recall God's faithfulness in your life. Like as you leave here, as you enter another week of work and stress and overload, like just recall God's faithfulness in your life. Remember his promises, that he is the promise keeper. Remember that by the death, burial, and resurrection of the true king, he provided for you the hope that never ends and a soon, soon to be re resurrection to incorruptibility where your enemies will never come against you. So as you leave here tonight, hold fast to the true king. Hold fast to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the true king who came, who died in place of sinners. God, we are thankful, God. That, he, that, that for those who trust in him, God, he's, he, for us, God, we, he's, he's taken our burden. He's given us a lighter load. We pray, God, that you would sustain us as we recall these truths throughout the week. As we remember your goodness, God, would, would you sustain us with those? God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Park Baptist Church. We pray, God, that you would bless her as she fulfills the Great Commission. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.